Today, I'm talking about teaching small transformers to rewrite ZX diagrams. This is joint work with um, Constantinos, Mekinizidis, Alexander Krangbrink, and Francois Chaton. Um, so why are we doing this? Well, broadly speaking, um, I think we all agree here, ZX rewriting is useful. It can be a very useful tool for solving various problems in quantum computing. Um, but we also know that rewriting ZX diagrams for arbitrary diagrams in a perfect way is hard. This is this is known to be a hard problem. Um, on the other hand, there's been a lot of like things in the literature where they use machine learning to solve hard problems empirically, approximately well. So the the goal of this project is to apply machine learning, which has been successful in other problems, to problems in quantum computing, specifically to the ZX calculus. Um, in this project, we focus on doing circuit compilation because it's a well-studied problem with a lot of benchmarks, so we can evaluate how well it does compared to other techniques. And um, all in all, this is a first step towards developing transformer-based compilers for um, quantum computers using methods inspired by machine, machine translation. So here's a bunch of papers that are related. The first few use various statistical techniques, such as um, simulator annealing, um, reinforcement learning, to uh, to rewrite ZX diagrams. And the last couple use reinforcement learning on quantum computing to do circuit optimization. Um, so so you can you can see lots of very related work here. The I would say the main difference in what I'm what we're doing in this project is we we're, we're specifically using transformers in a sequence to sequence approach to to rewrite these quantum circuits. I'll explain what that means more later. Um, yeah. So the ZX calculus, um, I think everyone in this call has some idea of what ZX calculus is, so I'll be brief on this. The ZX calculus is a, a rewrite, a diagrammatic calculus for reasoning with quantum computing. So quantum circuits can be represented as ZX diagrams, which consist of green and red spiders, the ZX spiders. And ZX diagrams can be transformed from one to another using rules from the ZX calculus that preserve the underlying tensor, the underlying semantics. If you do enough of these rewritings, you get a different diagram that could be useful in, say, circuit compilation, where you might have fewer gates that are costly. On the other hand, you have the transformer architecture, which has become the de facto machine learning architecture used in natural language processing. The, the, the key part of the transform model is the attention mechanism. And the attention mechanism um, is innovative in that it lets you weigh the importance of different words within the sentence in the context of natural language processing. But we will use it. Instead of sentences, we're going to put different put different symbols in, different tokens. Um, I'm not going to go too deeply into the transformer model to start with. Um, all I'm going to say here is it's mainly used as a sequence to sequence model. So instead of feeding um, a stream of words in, a stream of tokens that represent words, um, we're going to put in like a different language. We're going to have a language to encode our quantum circuits or our six diagrams and that use it to solve our problem. I'll illustrate this with a few examples. So the original use case of a transformer in um, the 2017 paper, the, the seminal transformer paper um, is to do a translation, right? So to benchmark the transformer, they, they fed in sentences in French, one character at a time, one token at a time, and the transformer processed that and output a new sequence of tokens, and they will represent an English sentence. Um, so in this case, you convert your problem, um, your problem examples, which are sentences, into a stream of tokens by using a tokenizer. Uh, and then the the quality of the translation is evaluated using some some metric. Here's a more unusual example. This is um this is work from one of our co-authors, um, Francois. Uh, in this example, he uses um 
the transformer, instead of doing translation of natural language, he uses to compute um, a specific function, which is given a mathematical expression, it returns the, the symbolic integral of that expression. So how does he do this? How is this done? Um, you, you take the tree, which is, you know, normally not a string of characters. It's, it's normally a tree shapes rather than a linear thing. And you, you parse the tree and you, you tokenize that tree into a stream of tokens here. Like you can turn this expression X plus Y times Z to times plus X, Y, Z. So this is, this is just prefix notation. Um, and this, this, this is enough to specify the tree in terms of the string of tokens. So if you feed these st string of tokens into the transformer and you train it over more examples, you're gonna, the, the transformer is able to in fact output a new set of sequence, a new sequence, a new set of tokens. And when that is parsed properly back into the tree, that represents the integral of the original expression. And how is this, how is the correctness of this evaluated? Well, you can take the output string of tokens, try to parse it back into a tree. Um, hopefully like it's syntactically correct. Um, and if it's syntactically correct, then you can differentiate that, ex that expression tree and see using some sort of computer algebra software, whether that new expression is equivalent to the original expression. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Um, right. So what we're doing here instead, instead of inputting trees or French or English into our transformer, we're going to input encodings for ZX diagrams into the transformer and get a new stream of tokens that represents another ZX diagram. And in this way, we're going to do compilation or simplification of the ZX diagrams. And specifically, we're going to work with graph ZX diagrams, um, which are in effect, just simple colored open graphs So simple in the sense that they don't have parallel edges. Well, these diagrams can be simplified in such a way that there aren't any parallel edges. And open in the sense that some of the vertices could be boundary vertices and colored in the sense that some vertices will be labeled. Well, yeah, vertices will be labeled with phases and information. Um, and the encoding is, I'll go more into this, go more into detail about this later. But effectively, the tokenizer here is going to take one of these graph ZX diagrams and um, turn it into an adjacent C list or some sort. Um, but yeah, we have we have means to convert ZX diagrams into a string of tokens and back using a parser. So so this fits within our model, our framework. And to evaluate the correctness of this, we're going to take the output of the transformer, which is a stream of tokens, try to parse it back into a ZX diagram. And if that if that succeeds, if that's syntactically correct, then we, we combine the output of that that output with the adjoint of its in, of the input and um, see if we can simplify to that identity. If that's possible, then we know that the the compilations succeeded, right? At least that um, the compilation is semantically correct. And that you, you get the same diagram with your resources, perhaps. I'm going to do a very quick recap of the graph ZX. So the main idea here is that you take um, the ZX diagram, you you take all the X nodes and you do a change of basis and turn them into Z nodes with Hadamard edges around them. And then you replace the Hadamard edges with, with these blue blue wires. Um, and after the few moves below, you'll get a simple graph. So you're not going to get any parallel edges. Um, for example, here you get, you, you, this is done using Fusion. Here, this is done using the hot floor, and yeah, these, these follow similarly. Yeah, so you can turn you can turn any here's an example of a ZX diagram being fused and simplified. So it becomes a simple open graph. Once we have a ZX graph ZX diagram. Then the full reduce algorithm in physics, which is um, a software library that acts on graph ZX diagrams, 
it proceeds to apply these rules known as local complementation and pivoting. Um, you've probably seen this already. So the way it works is it takes the local complementation takes these Clifford spiders, which are spiders with bases of multiple or pi over two multiples, and it removes them and proceeds to toggle the connections between its its neighborhood. And then um, pivoting was similarly, you take two Pauli vertices, which are vertices with multiples of pi with, with, of pi. You remove them and then you toggle the connections between um, the neighborhood of U, the, the the neighborhood of V, and then the the shared neighborhood of U and V, and you and you change the phases accordingly. There's also these these edge cases of pivoting, which um, known as gadget and boundary pivots. So if you do a pivot on a Pauli vertex and some some other phase, you're gonna you're gonna get something similar to the pivot rule, but in, in, you will you will obtain a phase gadget here. So this is this is what is known as a phase gadget, and um, something similar happens when you apply the boundary pivot. Um, these are these are steps in the full reduce algorithm, which which is something we're trying to learn using the transformer. And there's a few more rules left. So once you have, um, once you apply all these rules, you will have a bunch of phase gadgets, and uh, we have a rule saying. If two phase gadgets share the exact same neighborhood, you're able to fuse them into, into one by combining the phases and replacing, yeah, removing one of the phase gadgets. And there's a rule here saying if you have a one-legged phase gadget, you can just remove that phaseless spider and then just combine yeah, with another phase gadget. So so I mean it's 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 not super important to to understand all of these rules or remember them. I'm just trying to illustrate the task that we're trying to perform. Um, it's a rather it's a rather complex task to because the transformer is not given any information, any prior knowledge about this problem. So it doesn't know that its input is a graph. It doesn't know the CX diagram. It doesn't know anything about quantum. It doesn't know anything about um, pivoting a local computation. It's just given sequences, these these examples of input and output sequences, and it's going to learn how to translate between them. So this is um yeah, this is one of the this is how we encode a graph ZX diagram into the streamer tokens. And yeah, I'll go through this in more detail. And I'm I'm happy to kind of stop for questions if anyone's confused about this this format. So in the in the first, I've color coded these tokens, and in the first bunch of these tokens, um colored in this, yeah. These tokens first indicate the um, these are vertex attributes, right? So NT0 refers to the fact that this vertex, the, the zero vertex, is um is a boundary vertex, so it's type zero, and then um it has no phase. So as a multiple of four, like pi over four, it's it's zero. So it's zero times pi over four. So that's a boundary vertex here. Similarly for the for the next two. And um, after here, you have actually reached this way up. So it's NT1, 4P0 refers to this vertex where it's the first node type. So it's a Z, it's a Z spider, but it also has no face. So 4P0. If you go further down, you'll get, you'll get this example where you have a, a Z spider with face pi. So that probably refers to the spider here. So the first bunch of tokens just specify what color the, the vertex is and what phase it is. Um, after that, similarly, you're going to have some edge attributes. So these tells you the edge types. So so there's this whole bunch of edges here. Here's an edge, here's an edge, here's an edge. It's going to list out, it's a dictionary effectively of, of the edge types. So one represents the a, a normal edge, and then ET2 represents a Hadamard edge. Once we know all the edge and vertex informations, then we specify the connectivities, right? So afterwards, you have a bunch of edge pairs. I've colored them using alternate colors so you can see how it works. So here you have EP0 and EP3. That tells you effectively that 
there's an edge between vertex zero and vertex three, and that there's a edge between vertex one and vertex four, and so on and so forth. So this is this part is effectively an adjacency list. Note that like I'm just interleaving these characters and I don't have any special tokens kind of like grouping these tokens together. I'm just it's just using the fact that they're like one after the other, it's, it's it's able to tell that these tokens come in pairs, effectively. Does this make sense? I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about this encoding. Okay, no, all good. So, so hopefully my explanation was clear. So, um, yeah, let's keep going. All right. So some more settings. So given given the encoding above, there's around uh, roughly around like a hundred tokens in the vocabulary. That's how many kind of effectively how many words we have in this ZX language, um, which is not very, not very much actually, and um, instead of having a pre-generated data set of like train test and evaluate. We we generate these examples on the fly. Um, so at every epoch we generate dynamically 300,000 examples and we feed it into transformers for training. And once we, at the end of every epoch, we're gonna generate another 10,000 examples. And we, at that point we do evaluation. And and these examples are generated using, the generators within physics. So physics comes with from generators that generates like Clifford circuits, Clifford C circuits, C not circuits, and so on. Um, so I generate these circuits, apply for reduce from physics, and then feed these examples to the transformer. And some more details on the actual transformer architecture. We use um, six to eight encoded decoded layers. We tried, we played around with these, and um, the embedding dimension is five and twelve with six attention heads. So, so this is very standard. It's not a very large transformer. Um, and and this, this all fits within a single GPU. Um, and the training time takes, you know, one day, maybe like up to three days if you want to squeeze a few, couple more percent of the accuracy. And um, so the last function is, is the cross entropy function. So the way, the way this works is once we output the sequence, from the transformer given the input, we compare the output the predicted sequence with the with the you know the sequence provided by the example. And and it's just going to check character by token by token whether the, it matches exactly with with the the generated sequence. Um so so if it outputs an alternate graph that is um semantically correct and solves the task like it it is a graph normal form. Um, it's a pseudo normal form from from graph ZX, but it's a different sequence. Then it's going to penalize it um, at training time. However, at, at validation time, at, if at, yeah, it's going to it's going to do the right thing. It's going to do it's going to take the generator output, take its adjoint, and combine it with with the with the input, and then apply for reduce. So it's going to be able to also you know include alternative but correct examples and in, um, in the validation score. Yeah, and we use Adam with um, yeah, with this learning rate. Um, yeah, so so this is one one of the examples that might contrast with other projects. Um, this this training is always all done. The model fits within one GPU. So so in contrast, some of these other models might take a dozen GPUs or like much, 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 much more. So this is a relatively small um, setup. So some results. Um, the first table here, the first figure here, you can see we we ran, we trained this model on like circuits of various inputs. These are, each grid here is a separate run. Well, it's the best of three or three separate runs of various um, sizes of quantum circuits. So um, as you can see, 
um, as you increase depth, the, the accuracy goes down. And I just want to note that the depth here follows the same notation as depth in phys physics in the generator. So, so here, depth actually refers to the number of gates rather than like maybe circuit depth. Which so here you can see this is this kind of explains why when you have a so it turns out the model when you train it it's able to to do well on um wide but shallow circuits even though it's a long sequence but it doesn't do so well when it's uh a narrow but deep circuit so three qubits but like 40 gates it seems like it's not able to kind of do as much look ahead because this conversation is very sequential right and and it's and the transformer is going to do a constant amount of work given yeah it's it's, it's, it's the, the amount of work the transformer does isn't going to scale given a longer a longer sequence well it's going to scale like it's going to take more tokens in but it doesn't it doesn't know that full reduce is doing more computation there so so eventually it kind of it's not able to see the pattern so the accuracy drops a lot but it's able to to learn um wide but shallow circuits and then here, um, here's a bunch of accuracies. Oh, sorry. So this, the first figure, I believe, is generated on. Um, these are Clifford plus C circuits. And then here on the right, we have um, we also tried it on different, um, different types of generators. So in physics, there's the C not generator, there's a Clifford generator, and a Clifford plus C generator. And we tried it on diff different ones. And here it seems you actually get a better score. A better accuracy and um, validation accuracy for Clifford plus T circuits than Clifford circuit, Clif than just normal Clifford circuits. And my explanation for that is when this the full reduce algorithm doesn't really do much on T gates. Um, so by actually inserting these T gates um, into the circuit, physics is is not able to like do as much simplification. So so the pattern is actually easier to learn, even though there's there's these T gates which are kind of considered hard to minimize. Here's an example of kind of the algorithm action. So here's here's a here's some ver some quantum circuit. Um in fact in fact a Clifford quantum circuit. Um with, with 20 qubits and 35 gates. And this is it after applying for reduce. So the transformer is able to, to see completely fresh examples of these quantum circuits and output a string of tokens that can be passed back into, into this diagram. So so it's you can see it's able to learn very complex relationships um, that, that are you know quantum in nature without any extra information, without any prior inductive bias. Um, and because there are, um, yeah. So, so you might ask, you might ask why, why you, by generating these examples on the fly, wouldn't you have a chance of putting something in the training set that later appears in the validation set? Well, um, because there's so many different possibilities, um, it's highly unlikely for the generator to, to see like, like duplicate examples and also memorizing all these examples would be far beyond the kind of memorization capacity of the model. So so I would say the transformer is kind of generalized or reduced for fixed quant and circuit sizes. So yeah, one thing we could do to to ameliorate the kind of degradation performance for for deep circuits is to is to modify for reduce to kind of return intermediate steps. So instead of doing instead of performing this simplification algorithm until there are no more um, Clifford and uh, Pauli vertices, you could instead ask the for reduce function to be more of a, you know, more of an iterator and return intermediate steps of the simplification. So let's say it returns an intermediate graph after every 50 steps or 100 steps. Um, and we train the transformer to learn to do full reduce like 50 steps or 100 steps of full reduce at a time um so we 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 did this we 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 changed the code and then we we put it into the model and it seems to learn a bit better although i need to we need we need to 
do more analysis to like produce more, more precise figures. Um, so it seems to do better for, for for reduce when you do kind of less steps. But if you think about boosting, which is let's say like um let's say I had a train model and then I apply this uh, um, model on the output multiple times to effectively do the full full reduce, um then then the accuracy is gonna drop right because I need to have n successive predictions so to to have the final output be be correct. So 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 actually you need a much higher accuracy because because the the kind of the failure is gonna increase over multiple runs. So yeah, this is this is kind of the first half of the the work so far. Um, so, so that's been that's aiming at um, applying the transformer to learn the full reduce algorithm on graph ZX diagrams. However, um, the full reduce algorithm is a deterministic polytime function. So some of you may ask, like, why did you, you know, why did you even train this? This is something that can be implemented in, you know, without using machine learning. So, so well, well, I would say it's just a proof of concept to to better understand what a transformer can or cannot do. So let's let's try to study a harder problem, right? So, in in the second half of this work, we try to study, um, we try to tackle the task of t count reduction. As as you know, the task of t count reduction is, um, MP hard. And um, it's also approximately universal. So given the Clifford plus t gate set. You can express um, any quantum circuit, any unitary, up to arbitrary precision. So, so this is a good, you know, meaningful to meaningful task that is hard, that may benefit from from using machine learning, right? So, a bit more background on Clifford plus T circuits. And um, Clifford plus T circuits can be, well, you know, Clifford plus T gate set consists of, you know, the C naught and the Hadamard. And the T gate, and um, and you know you can write the C C naught as C Z and Hadamard. So it, really, most of the gate set can you can you can write the gate set as diagonal gates plus the Hadamard. So so therefore, Clifford plus T circuits can be written as a bunch of interleaving diagonal and Hadamard layers. And um, the diagonal unitaries, these diagonal layers, can be expressed as a list of phase gadgets. Um, as they, they're complete over diagonal unitaries. And then, um, and some of these Hadamards can be converted to phase gadgets using Insula. And that allow, allows more of these phase gadgets to be combined. So we can have larger diagonal region to do simplification. Um, yeah, this is, is an example of how this, this Hadamard gadgetization is done. And once you have, um, Done this procedure, then you can focus on minimizing the T count within these diagonal regions. So here's um yeah, here's a um spider nest identity. Um these there's a family of these spider nest rules, and and there's there's one for every every n up to, um from from n equals four onwards. So so if you have like a a quantum circuit of n qubits, any subset of size at least four, you can apply some spider nest to it and then simplify the circuit. So if you happen to have a diagonal field of a C circuit and you can find over half of these gadgets in the spider nest identity, then by applying that spider nest identity here, you actually reduce the number of spiders that have um you know, that have that have odd multiples of T in it. And that allows you to reduce the T count. And yeah, spider nest identities are, are flexibly, they're complete over this family of quantum circuits. Yeah. So um, the spider nest rule is from, from this paper where they introduce the spider nest identities. And in this work, they um, apply this, this phase gadget elimination tactic 
where um, effectively the the algorithm looks for kind of spider nest of size up from four size spider nest of size four to five, and, and see whether they can be applied, and if it can be applied in such a way that then there's immediately a reduction in t count, then then it's applied. Um, so this is what this is what I mean by random greedy. And, and and this seems to have produced pretty good results in t count reduction. Um, so the, the the goal of this part of the project is to see whether using some machine learning techniques, um, using you know relatively me small to medium scale machine learning techniques, whether we could get further improvements by looking for more smart, like more clever, non greedy strategies for applying these um, spider nets to reduce t count. So yeah, generation, how does this work? So we need a generator and we need a tokenizer for this, right? So let's first talk about the generator for the estimates. Um, so here I first generate a list of phase gadgets that is equivalent to a density circuit for some n, n qubits. Once I have this list of gadgets, then I randomly split the phase gadgets such that I have two sets of phase gadgets. One, one set is twice the length of the other. And then I feed the, the longer sequence of phase gadgets after it's synchronized into the transformer. And then I train it to predict the sh sh shorter list of phase gadgets. So in some sense, I'm teaching it kind of the structure of diagonal with T circuits, like the equivalence classes between these T diagonal circuits. Um, so so well, what do I want to say? So the generation of this is relatively easy because I just need to apply in the first step, I just need to apply random spider nest moves onto the identity. And then but then when I do the split, um it's hard for it's relatively hard for the transformer to know kind of what the missing gadgets are, yeah. right? So there's this kind of asymmetry to problem. Um in in this other project where where um we do well Francois did, Francois and, and the co-author, the symbolic integration. One way to generate these symbolic expressions or to generate these examples without a symbolic integration tool is to start off with the right-hand side, start off with some random expression, and then apply differentiation, which is a much easier algorithm than integration, and then reverse the, reverse the inputs and outputs, right? So you feed... You generate the output, you differentiate it, and then that's that's your input. Um, so this is idea of backwards generation. Um, yeah. So so there's there's definitely lots of ways to kind of fine tune and improve this generation. So so if anyone has any ideas or suggestions on how to do this generation for for Spiderness, I'm happy to to listen. Here's one of the, here's an encoding of a diagonal clip with T circuits. Um, the first token just tells you how many qubits there are. That's just a, extra information that's fed in the transformer. And as you can see here, um, I have a, a token for qubit zero, qubit one, and qubit two, and then a phase that effectively just tells you that describes this phase gadget. And then here you, this describes this phase gadget with phase three pi over four. And then this gadget, and then this gadget. So it's, it's a pretty straightforward encoding. It's just a list of phase gadgets. Um, so we we train this over very small examples, um, and it trains okay. But the problem is, it's instead of instead of being limited by the, you know the generalization, the trainability of the problem, we're limited by how slow the transformer is on long sequences. Um, because the transformer runs quadratic with respect to sequence length, for larger circuits, you get very long sequences. And, and this becomes a problem when it comes to training because you need to train over a lot of examples. So one, one thing we tried to, to reduce the sequence length is to only store phase gadgets with, with odd multiples of phase because phase gadgets with even multiples of pi over four are effectively Clifford and 
they can be simplified or reduced away. They can be abstracted away from the problem. So the when we do this conversion, the way we verify quality of um, these diagonal cliffs with C circuits is by um, you know you combine the, out, the output with the adjoint of the input. And then, and then what you do is you verify it's equal to, you check whether it's equal to the density by applying spider and densities on, on phase gadgets that have, you know, more than four legs. And, and if you do this repeatedly, iteratively, um, you should arrive with, um, uh, a, a circuit with no phase gadgets of more than four qubits and if it's equal to that density circuit, then you know that, um, then you know that the 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 output circuit is equivalent. Otherwise, then it's not equivalent. And yeah, this this is actually akin to to read mother codes, because there's a correspondence between reducing the t count and um, doing read mother decoding. Another thing you could try to reduce the sequence length of these Clifford's t circuits. Is instead of having one token for every qubit of the gadget, which can be quite long for um, you know larger circuits, classically you would have the sequence link will be O of number of qubits times number of gadgets. If you have phase gadgets, when you generate phase gadgets, you you kind of decide whether it has a leg or not a leg on that qubit with you know equal probability or like constant. Yeah. Um, so the sequence like will be O of n qubits times number of gadgets. Um, and when you square that, that becomes quite large. Um, instead of doing that, what if we can somehow have like one token per gadget effectively? Um, that will give you a much shorter sequence length and the transform will be able to process it much quicker. But the problem with that is um, the vocabulary will be, will be exponentially large and it will be hard for the transform to generalize because it will we wouldn't even have seen some of the phase gadgets generated at validation time for the large end. So how would you tackle this? Um, well, so one thing we're proposing is to have um, this effectively a nested model where we, we have the usual transformer here, but we also have a transformer encoder. So um, we start off by listing, instead of having um, the usual encoding that I described earlier, we can instead have um, effectively a list of phase gadgets. So, so there's a list of this, and um, within each of these lists is a binary bit string, and that um, and the one tells you there's a there's a leg on that phase gadget uh, on that qubit for that phase gadget and zero otherwise. So, effects, so this is a three legged. The first row here indicates a three legged phase gadget, and then the second row here indicates five bigger phase gadgets which acts on every qubit except the third or second one well and then well on initially this is this is looking like a much more uh, redundant encoding so you're going to have, have a longer sequence length but actually if we apply the transform encoder to take each of these lists into into um, a single embedding then effectively the sequence length the length of the sequence that we feed into this Second transformer is only the number of gadgets. And as we know, phase gadgets can mute with each other. So um, the ordering of these phase gadgets don't actually matter when we feed into the transformer. And and one thing about the transformer is there's there's no inherent order um for the for the vectors. They're not they're not um actually, you know, there's no favoritism on the vectors. It's the ordering is actually uh, retroactively specified by adding something known as positional encodings into these into these vectors. Um, they effectively you, you kind of superimpose a sine wave or cosine wave onto onto these vectors, and and the transform is able to learn that some sort of ordering. Um, so so in this case, since the ordering of the phase gadgets don't matter, we can just remove the positional um, embeddings. Then then it's able to kind of treat the phase gadgets in the same way, even if a different sequence of phase gadgets or a different ordering is fed in. Um, or the same set of phase gadgets in a different ordering is fed in. So, so instead of 
think of this as a sequence. You can now think of this like a set, the set translation. Um, and once we do that, we can we can get the transformer to predict the next gadget, and then do this iteratively in the same way. So so it's able to do this, do the same task, but with a much shorter sequence length. Um, yeah, we we're still we're still working on this. Um, hopefully, we'll have some results soon. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, thank you for listening. Um, I'd like to hear some questions. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, you can either clap, give clap emojis, whatever you feel like. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll open the floor to any questions. Hi, great talk. Um, I have a question. So the, the ZX form of like the spider nest circuits, like the circuits with the phase gadgets, um, looks very much like uh, you, you could represent it as a hypergraph because everything commutes. Um, so it seems to me like one way you could try and do this is have some kind of like a hypergraph neural network. So you, you define a graph from this circuit and you want to predict labels on the edges, like whether they should be included in the next phase gadget or not. And you could do some kind of hypergraph neural network. And maybe this is more efficient than a transformer. Ah, uh, uh, it's very cool. So here, like, like because you can think of this as like a this X thing as a hyper edge. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that that would be really cool. Yeah, it's 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 that's definitely something worth trying. Thanks. Actually, um, related to that question, um. I know that there are a lot of um, quite out out of the box packages for transformer models, but less so for hypergraph neural networks. So um, my question related to that is whether you use something that's quite out the box for these transformers, because if you, you if that's if that's the case, it's pretty cool that you can just kind of port those things over. Actually, that's that's a very good question. So, um, so my understanding. Of this is um, so of, you have the transformer model in PyTorch, so so you can use you can use transformers out of the box, um, but there's a whole bunch of auxiliary code, you know, that does generation, you know, batching, all that stuff is, I mean, it's it's not too bad, but but that needs to be written from scratch. So there's there's no like, you know, there's there's a there's there's a library. Um, Hugging Face has a whole bunch of transformers, and they're super easy to use, super nice. However, these these seem to only work for pre-trained models, so like BERT, kind of that kind of stuff. So since these models are trained from scratch, um, I don't want to I don't want a really large model that's seen like all of English to do CCAM reduction. Um, um, seems like I need to like code it from scratch. Like it's not too bad, but I need to. There's no like dot fit kind of like. Library for these transformers, but it's it's yeah it's it's relatively straightforward. I think it's cool. Thanks. So um. I missed the first 50 minutes of the talk, so sorry if this was already um, discussed. You trained the transformer for end-to-end -end analysis, where you have your starting graph and your final graph, but you didn't train this for doing just a couple of steps, right? Saying, oh, this is the next step, this is the next step. Was this a deliberate choice to go for this end-to-end -end thing? So we, you we, we, we that you go to bigger circuits, you need to do it step by step anyway. So yeah, we, we started off doing end to end definitely just to see how it would do and it seems to do okay but it deteriorates when you get really deep circuits because it seems to not be able to do like deep calculations like super deep calculations but but we did try doing this kind of step by step effectively um or like at least like a dozen steps like you know a few steps ahead and it, it also works um one thing one thing i found interesting is like because we we kind of like modify food used to do this iterative version it it in a way, like 
um, because I'm only feeding in examples and not and not the inter- the kind of the program states of reduce in a way like it doesn't have complete information of what to do right because it doesn't know whether it's about to do a kind of a <laughs> local complementation pass or like a pivot pass but it seems to still do okay um, so so that's interesting um, but yeah we we need to run more experiments to kind of see whether this kind of multi step approach could be could kind of help us you know do really large and deep circuits flexibly and here the data you give it is just the output of full reduce so then it can never learn to do better than full reduce because it will just learn to copy it but suppose i want to train it to like make the graph sparser for instance um i guess then you would have to do some kind of unsupervised learning right if you want to do that if, if you don't already have a function that can do it for you yeah so so actually um the some so the way the way the um so we train the we train the sequence to do we train the model to do um exact matching right so we wanted to match the exact sequence and that's how we kind of chose the loss function to to kind of penalize the loss the the model to do this but at validation time we actually um we 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 include um semantically equivalent graphs um is part of accuracy so so in um when we, at validation time the model actually produces some graphs that are semantically equivalent but have fewer nodes than for reduce so it's able it's able to do that some of the time um but yeah if you want to do this you know properly do better than for reduce then yeah you need you need to do something other than just applying for reduce to the circuit and maybe this kind of backwards generation approach could be useful where you start for somehow you had a sparse circuit mm-hmm. and you you make it less sparse Yeah, thanks. I had another question related to the training, um, which is that when you feed in your input data, your output circuit might not necessarily be the correct circuit when you're just um, when you're spinning this model out on just unseen data, or even seen data, um, but you have the labels to to compare it with. Um, so that means that, it, so so this, am I correct in that this model might not necessarily spit out the right circuit when you use it, or one that is yeah, a valid so, circuit? Right, so, so these accuracies, right? These accuracies tell you not only, they tell you to, like, like at least two things. Uh, first of all, like the output, the sequences is, is at least a graph, right? It, it has to be, it can be parsed into a graph. Um, it could also spit out like complete nonsense. Um, but yeah, it, it, this accuracy includes the fact that it's a semantically equivalent graph. So, so equivalent tensor has fewer nodes than for reduce. Um, but yeah, like if, like, let's say here, like if it's 99.8, like 0.2% of the time, it does the wrong thing. Definitely. Um, but yeah, oh, it's okay. an interesting thing because because the transformer, the transformer is the loss function is chosen such that it has you you're training it to learn exactly that sequence. But along the way, it does give alternative but semantically correct graphs. And and that is that is um included as part of the validation accuracy. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. 